Hi, welcome to Concordia's weekly message. Some of you are tuning in for the first time and I want to introduce myself. I'm Richard, Concordia's pastor. Thanks for being here today on this Mother's Day weekend. And we're glad that you're with us. As, as you're going through the message today, there's a couple things that I want to draw your attention to that'll help. There's a listening guide that you can download if that helps you to focus. Uh, there's also some spots we're going to ask you to, to pause and reflect on something. I would encourage you to, to hit pause and, and do that work there. It's going to help bring that more into focus and how it connects with your own life. Uh, there's some singing elements that we're adding to this. Uh, those are going to come at you in a second. There's also an opportunity um, that you'll see to, to give. Um, at Concordia, we don't believe that you give to make God do something for you. We believe that we have a generous God who's already given us everything we have. What I want to encourage you to, to understand is that when you give, wherever you give, you're taking steps closer to God's heart. So if you've never given before, I want to encourage you to start. Um, find a place, uh, a cause that's close to your heart. Probably it's in your neighborhood, in your community, maybe somewhere around the world, and, and give there. If you're connected with the church, or if you're connected with this church, uh, there's some secure online ways that you can give as well through our app or through our website. Again, thanks for being here. Uh, some of those singing elements are coming at you right now.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Doubt and skepticism have always been around, but perhaps because I've always experienced this last year, doubt and skepticism and even cynicism seem to be a more settled part of our lives. At least, it seems to be that way with, with me. Okay. Case in point, number one. Um, I know that God actually created government for good. To, to restrain evil, to provide order in society. If you're a believer and you doubt that, go read Romans 13 sometime. But you know, this past year, um, it seems like I've been channeling my inner Ron Swanson. And I've been skeptical about decisions and policies at pretty much every level of government and any and all sides of the political spectrum. I've just been skeptical about all of it. Case in point number two, uh, I used to try to believe the best in people most of the time. And for criticism, I just kind of let it roll off my back most of the time. But now with the weight of this COVID year just kind of piling up, I, I find myself 
questioning other people's motives and actions more and more, especially when I'm being criticized. It shouldn't be that way, but it is. Um, doubt and skepticism seem to be running deeper in me than, than they ever have before. But maybe you know what I'm talking about. Because I got a feeling I, I'm not alone in this, right? I, I hear uh, all people, all sorts of people, being skeptical about their their jobs. I hear them being skin, cynical and skeptical about their relationships. I hear them being cynical and skeptical about their leaders. I hear them being cynical and skeptical about their churches. I, I hear them being cynical and skeptical about all these changes and what the world new normal is going to be. I even hear them being cynical and skeptical about God, and that's not just outside the church. It's from people inside the church, too. In fact, I've been hearing so much cynicism and skepticism this year that it makes me wonder whether, whether skepticism is going to be a bigger part, not only of the next year, but of the next generation. Of the generation whose growing up and developmental years were so dramatically influenced by this last intensive year and then some. Now, all doubt and skepticism isn't bad. Right, some doubt, some level of, of doubt or skepticism is necessary to, to protect us, to keep us safe, to a, avoid us being taken advantage of. But I, I have a feeling that if we take too much of that doubt and skepticism with us into the new normal, that, that's not going to be good. And here's why. Because behind all the doubt and the skepticism is this fundamental question. Who's word can I trust? Whose word can I trust? And, and people have been so hurt, so wounded, so disappointed by so many different things at so many different levels this past year that for a lot of people the answer seems to be almost no one's. Almost no one's. The, the only one I'm going to trust is me. The only opinion I'm going to trust is mine. The only word that counts is mine. The only things I'm going to believe are those things that I can see and verify with my own eyes and my senses. Here's the problem with that. The problem is that the relationships and intimacy and yes, even faith are built on trusting others. They're built on trusting others and trusting them to keep their word. So, so if doubt and skepticism isn't just in our lives, but it rules our lives, that's not healthy. It ruins relationships. It cripples faith. And, and sometimes it keeps either one of those from even getting started. I, I don't want that to be my world. I don't want that to be your world either. Well, in, in the story of Thomas... Jesus shows us the way through that doubt and that skepticism towards greater faith and hope and joy. That's what we're going to dig into today, Thomas's story. My name is Thomas, and I struggle with doubt. I followed Jesus for years, from the very first day he called me. I saw things so amazing they defied explanation. I believed. But then things fell apart. I witnessed the betrayal that led to the cruel march to Calvary and his agonizing crucifixion. I survived, but everyone I knew scattered. My world collapsed. Then came news of the empty tomb, the very first Easter. But I resisted. The image of his broken, lifeless body was still burned into my memory. I experienced his death that I couldn't believe. Not until I see the scars with my own eyes and touch them with my own hands, I told the others. I wasn't ready to put my trust in something again. 
But Jesus came to me. He knew my doubts. He even named them. But he wasn't angry. He didn't rebuke me or dismiss me. He looked at me with those familiar eyes and offered me his scarred hands and sighed. In that moment, I experienced his resurrection and I believed. I know firsthand it's difficult to believe in what you can't see. And yet all around you are people whose lives and stories have scars that bear witness to the meaning of Easter. Yes, these people have been wounded, but they've experienced redemption and healing through Jesus. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection were meant to rescue the doubters, the debtors, and the broken, people like you and me. He met my doubts with grace and love, and he only asked one thing of me, believe. Well, let's dig into Thomas' story a little more from some of the texts that we have about Thomas. You go back to, to Mark chapter 3, and you see that Thomas is there in the original list of the 12 that Jesus called into this special relationship with him where they'd follow him around and they'd watch him and they'd listen to him and, and they'd learn from him for the, for the better part of three years. Now, now what does that tell us about Thomas? Well, it tells us that Thomas was close to Jesus and he knew Jesus about as well as anyone. He jumped to John chapter 11, uh, not too long before uh, Jesus' death and resurrection. And you see there in John chapter 11 that Jesus' friend Lazarus had, uh, was getting really sick. And they send some messengers to tell Jesus about that. He delays for a little bit and, and his disciples are, are thinking that maybe it's because Jerusalem was a pretty dangerous place for Jesus. The religious leaders were out to get him at that point. Now, that's not why Jesus delayed, but the disciples don't know that. So then when Jesus says, okay, now let's go to Bethany around Jerusalem, here's what Thomas says. Let me read it to you. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So what does that tell you about Thomas? Well, to me, it says Thomas is really loyal. He's loyal because he's going to go with Jesus, even if it's dangerous, even if it's dangerous for him. And he's somewhat courageous as well. And then we jump ahead to some things that Jesus was talking to his, his disciples uh, on that night when he gave them the Lord's Supper. It's in John chapter 14. And Jesus is kind of laying some things out for them. Let me read that to you. John 14. Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were so, were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am, and you know the way to the place where I'm going. Now here's, here's the part about Thomas. The next sentence says this. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? So what does that tell you about Thomas? Well, he was strong in loyalty and courage, but not so strong in imagination. See, Thomas saw the world the way he was raised to see the world. And he had some very carefully constructed boxes of, well, this is the way things work, and this is the only way things work. And he really didn't have the imagination to conceive of other possibilities. Which to me might explain why Thomas has a hard time believing that Jesus had, had been raised from the dead. Now, now Thomas had seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. So he knows that Jesus has all this power, but it was somebody else raising Lazarus from the dead. And now Jesus himself is dead. And, and the way Thomas saw things Jesus had the power to do something big, but now he's dead and that power died with him. Dead people do not raise themselves. Now, Thomas is also missing when 
Jesus appeared to the other disciples. Here's how it's recorded. Um, now Thomas, known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And no reason is given for his absence. My guess, remember Thomas is close to Jesus and loyal and courageous, but also not a lot of imagination. My guess is it's, he's hurt. He's been hurt that Jesus died and he just can't be around people that are reminding him of Jesus. Now, now his friends have some good news because they tell Thomas this this incredible thing that they're eager to tell him. Here's how we read next in John chapter 20. The disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But Thomas, he's skeptical. He's doubting, maybe even a little cynical. Okay, here's, here's what we read. He said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So why does Thomas doubt his friend's word? He's been with these guys for the better part of, of three years. Why does Thomas doubt that Jesus is alive again? Well, think back to what we know about Thomas. Maybe some of it's, well, guys, I need what you got. Remember, you're telling me, you're all excited. You're telling me that Jesus showed up and, and he showed me his hands and his side. Well, I, I didn't see that and, and I need that too. I want that just like you got. Some of it might be, maybe it was a lack of experience with this sort of thing. I mean, how many resurrections had he seen? Some of it, maybe it's an inability to uh, think of something, to conceive of something that he couldn't verify, that he couldn't see. Something that was way outside the lines that he'd been taught to, to color in, uh, the way he'd been taught that things work in the world. Maybe it was that lack of imagination. And maybe it was that, that, that hurt, that being deeply hurt and, and not wanting to take the risk of being hurt even deeper if this turned out to be untrue. I think it was probably some combination of all of those things that made Thomas a doubter and a skeptic at first. All right, but, but what matters for us isn't so much the reason that Thomas was a skeptic, but the fact that Thomas is stuck, right? The doubt and skepticism, they're running pretty deep in Thomas at this point. And Thomas sees no way through other than seeing things that he can't see or imagine. And we've already seen Thomas really doesn't have a lot of skills in that department. But Thomas isn't really alone in that, is he? All right, there, there are a lot of people today and there's, there's a lot of church people today who just can't see where God is right now, who just can't see what God is up to in, in times like these. And maybe with the stuff going on in, in your life right now, maybe you're one of them. Maybe you feel stuck too. Not, not really liking where you are, but unable to find your, your way through even, even though you want to. All right? Now, you know what to find your way through? First, you gotta come to grips with where you are. So take a few minutes to stop and think before we go on. Why don't you do is hit pause in a moment and reflect on this. What are those places that you feel stuck in right now? What places do you feel stuck in right now? And, and where are you wondering about or even doubting God's presence or God's power or his timing? Hit pause and think about that right now. So as you're thinking through and, and talking through those, those doubts and, and maybe even some of the skepticism that you have, those questions about God's timing or his, or his power or his presence, I want you to understand something. You're, you're not alone. A lot of Christians feel the same way because doubt is normal. Doubt is normal even for people who've been following Jesus for a really long time. 
And especially if, like Thomas, we're wired much more to focus on and to think about what you can see rather than the possibilities of what might be with a God of miracles. Um, so yeah, doubt is normal. But just because doubt is normal doesn't mean that it's good. It's certainly not good to stay stuck in it forever. See, because staying in doubt sucks the life out of us. Staying in doubt sucks the joy out of us. Staying in doubt keeps us much, much farther from God than God wants us to be from, from him. And the issue for Thomas and us is we can't find our way out of that. We're, we're stuck. Right? We, it's like we don't like where we are and we don't like how, how we're feeling, but we're stuck. And we're powerless to change. Either that or we're just storming out of the room. Good thing that Jesus shows up. Good thing that Jesus shows up alive and well and fully present gets right in the middle of our doubt in order to lead us out of that stuck space and back to faith and hope and joy. Let me read you that account from John chapter 20. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Now there's a, several things I see here that Jesus does to lead Thomas out of that stuck space where, where doubt and skepticism is starting to take root in his life. First thing I see is that Jesus actually gives Thomas some space. All right, what he does there is he lets Thomas doubts kind of linger with him for a while and lets Thomas wrestle between the, the, the tension of, of what he thinks he knows and, and the story of his friends uh, told of, of Jesus being alive. And he lets that internal struggle sow seeds of possibility in Thomas uh, so that when Jesus shows up, he's going to be ready to hear. So you can almost picture this going on in Thomas's mind for, for the week. This, I, I know this can't be, but, but could it be? No, 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 I know this can't be, but, but I know these guys. I, I know these guys, they're my friends, I've trusted them. Did they really see something? See, Jesus isn't afraid of our doubt, and he's not threatened by it. He actually understands it. He understands it, and because he does, he wants to help us through it, and he wants, us to, he wants to help us see that God's story is always bigger than ours. And, and so, Jesus is patient with us. He, he's patient with us, and he gives us some space with our doubts so that when he comes, we'll be better able to hear him. And that's the second thing I see here. At the right time, Jesus shows up. Right? Jesus doesn't leave Thomas with his doubts forever. And here's why that's important to see. See, a lot of times when you're doubting God, you're thinking that God's not around, that he's not present, that he's not listening, that he's not powerful. Um, or he's, if he is, he's kind of like way, 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 way far away. But that's not the truth. The truth is that Jesus is there. That, that he's close and he's waiting right there so for the moment where you are. See, he's waiting to be able to come into that moment of, of your weakness and come to the place of, of your doubt so he can give you the power to, to get back to faith. And so Jesus here actually initiates the contact with Thomas, probably because he knows that Thomas can't get there on his own. Now, don't miss this truth. Jesus meets us where we are, at the moment we are, instead of making us get our act together first. And so you see in, the, in, this, in the story of Thomas, a week before, the disciples, except for Thomas, were meeting in a room somewhere in Jerusalem behind locked doors. But Jesus came through the doors that were locked because they needed him to be there. 
Jesus came through the doors that were locked and he, and he said to them, peace, shalom, wholeness, wellness, that, that you see in a, in a living Nord, not a, not a dead Messiah. And then a week later, they're all gathered together. And this time Thomas is with them. And again, the doors are still locked. And Jesus comes right through. Comes right through those locked doors, even though nobody opened them. Because Thomas needed Jesus to be there. Thomas needed to see Jesus. Thomas needed that same word. Jesus says, peace, wholeness, wellness, shalom. Be with your, your whole person, your whole spirit. And you know what, 2,000 years later, it's, it's still the same. Sometimes the doors are locked. Sometimes we're hiding in these little spaces and we don't let anybody else in. We don't want anybody else to, to see or sense or experience what's going on with us. And the doors are locked and we're gonna keep them that way. And Jesus walks through the locked doors. And Jesus comes right where we are, in that place of our doubt and our skepticism and our fear, and he offers us, us hope because we're stuck and he doesn't want us to stay that way. Jesus comes and says, I'm, I'm here, All right, and I'm here for you. Let me, let me show you the possibilities when you color outside the lines. Let me give you a little more imagination than you have right now. Let me help you see what can happen when your construct actually allows for a God who is bigger than you are? Yeah. Which is that's what we need when we're stuck behind those locked doors dealing with our questions and our doubts. What we don't need at this point is for someone to say, told you so, told you so. That would make us feel about two inches tall, right? And, and we're already stuck, but we're starting to realize as Jesus comes through those locked doors, that he does keep his promises and that those doubts were unfounded. And Jesus knows that about us too. He knows we don't need someone to wag a finger. So the third thing I notice here is that, that Jesus deals with Thomas graciously. Jesus deals with Thomas graciously. He doesn't yell at Thomas for not believing what the others had said doesn't yell at Thomas for not believing or for forgetting what Jesus has said several different times that it's necessary I'm going to die, but I'm also going to rise. He doesn't yell at Thomas at all. He just enters and he speaks the same word, peace. He, he enters and he, and he gives Thomas then what he needs at that moment. And, and, and what he needs at that moment is to see and so instead of saying, get rid of this one, because he doesn't believe, Jesus says to Thomas, take a look. Take a look. See my, my hand. See my side. And then he speaks a word to Thomas, not of condemnation or accusation. What Jesus actually does here, notice he speaks to the faith that's still there. There's a lot of doubt, there's a lot of skepticism, but there's a little bit of faith that's still there, and that's what Jesus speaks to. Stop doubting and believe. And the fourth thing that Jesus does, and I think this is what moves Thomas out of being stuck, is Jesus points Thomas to his love. I'm talking there about the, the nail marks. I mean, do you ever wonder why Jesus' resurrected body had scars and, and wounds? I mean, wouldn't the physical presence of Jesus have been enough? Wouldn't they have been able to recognize him? Certainly. And certainly they could have touched him and felt him and, and since said, yes, he's really there. But Jesus shows the scars to remind them of his love. And so he points to the scars, the ones that he got when he died on a cross so we could live. The ones that he got dying on a cross so that our sins could be forgiven. The ones that he got when he died on a cross so that we could have peace with God. Yeah. The ones that are proof of his love. The ones are proof of his words and promises. The ones that are proof that he who is dead is now alive and his word which we doubted is actually true. You see, 
Because it's not the explanation to our mind that gets through our doubt. It's the witness to our heart. And, and, and the witness to our heart shows us Jesus' love. And in seeing Jesus' love and, and trusting that and, and trusting him and, and trusting the relationship, even when you still have some doubts about some of the things that are going on around you, uh, his hands, his side, right? The marks of his love. The, that's the proof that we're looking for. So one more question. As Jesus leads us through our doubt and questions and skepticism and maybe even some cynicism, is there anything we can do to cooperate with Jesus as he leads us through? Well, I think Thomas's story does give us a few suggestions. The first one is this. Attend. Okay? Attend. Remember in Thomas' story, Thomas was absent from the group that first time that Jesus showed up. And maybe he had a good reason. We always got reasons for, for not showing up, right? That's probably why God gave us the command, not the suggestion, remember the Sabbath day. See, had Thomas been there the first time, maybe the story would have been different. Uh, something about being where God is. He, you can sense his, his presence even if you can't see him. Something about being where God is, like in worship, that actually strengthens your faith. Second thing, well, give yourself time with your doubts and your questions. Right? Thomas did. He had a whole week before Jesus showed up to, again to lead him through that stuck place. Well, well give yourself time too. Go ahead and turn those doubts over and over in your mind and consider all the possibilities, especially if you believe in a God of miracles. Right? Understand that you don't have to have all the answers right away. If God's willing to give you some space, well, then give yourself some. Here's the third thing. Spend some time in the story. Right? Here, here's how Thomas 
part of the story ends in John chapter 20. Let me go back there and read that to you. After Thomas says, my Lord and my God, now I'm reading at verse 29, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The story of God, which God had written down for us. Jesus, he's saying these things are written so you might believe in the first place and so you might continue to believe. So when you're doubting and wondering and questioning, Lean back into the story. All right, lean back into the word. These things are written so that when you're doubting and questioning and wondering, you can go back and see who God is and what he's said and what he's done. And you can have faith. Lean back into your story and remember what God's done for you and what God's done for our church. And then the fourth thing, now this isn't in Thomas' story, but it's an important action if you're a believer. When you're questioning, wondering, doubting, skeptical, ask God for help. Ask God for help. I'm, I'm thinking of this story where there, there was a guy who was asking Jesus to heal his demon-possessed son, and he says this. It's in Mark chapter 9. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You know, that's been my prayer through this past year. Lord, I do believe. Help me where I'm struggling to believe. Help my unbelief. Help me overcome some of this doubt and skepticism. And if you're not yet a believer, well, you can ask God to and just ask Jesus to show you that he's real. And the fifth thing I see, and, and this is back in the story of Thomas, trust the relationship. Okay, trust the relationship. Focus on Jesus, not on your doubt. Focus on Jesus at the cross, not the things that you still don't understand. There's always going to be something that you don't quite understand. So just focus on Jesus. See his hands. Look, look at his side. Did he give his life for you? Did, did he willingly sacrifice himself for you? Did, did he love you so much that he was willing to go to death that he was willing to move heaven and earth to come back to life so that you can sense, even if you can't see his presence right now, consider that love and believe in Jesus. And give yourself some space with the rest of your doubts and questions. Give yourself some space for your faith to grow. Don't, don't worry about your doubts. God has a lifetime to get you through them. Until that one day, when none of your adults will matter anymore. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.